So my name is Camilla Brown and I'm a writer, curator and academic. I specialise in contemporary photography and film art and I worked for many years as senior curator at the Photographers Gallery in London and I've been based in Derbyshire for over six years now. I teach on an MA at the University of Derby and I'm a BA at Middlesex University. I still regularly write and publish on photography and I'm associate curator at Grain and also on the steering group for the Format Photography Festival. The following talk is a version of a paper I gave at the Format Festival Conference in 2015 and it was subsequently published in an academic journal. The paper is called The Personal is Political in Photography Today. In my research, I noticed that a notable number of women artists were making themselves a subject of their own work. Many make it a recurrent theme of their practice. Others seem to go through a phase, either early or later in their careers, where they feature themselves in their work. I wanted to consider why this might be. Was this an inevitable byproduct of feminist studies, a subject covered in most art schools? Most art, women artists grapple with theories about the engendered male gaze and attempt to position themselves within it. For young women artists, it can almost be a rites of passage through which they must pass to find their own artistic voice. This paper is what grew from my research, where I focused on the work of three female photographers working in the UK, E.J. Major, Trish Morrissey and Sean Bonnell. Each of the artists has been asked to respond to a series of questions and their comments punctuate this talk. I would like to thank them for contributing in this way. As this is being recorded and broadcast online, each artist has also granted copyright permission for me to share their images with you. So how the personal remains political in photography today. First series of work I'm going to show is EJ Major, Shoulder to Shoulder, 2009 to 20. It is Tuesday the 14th of March 1914. At 11am a woman described as small and wearing a tight-fitting grey coat and skirt stood in front of a painting at the National Gallery. The painting was the Rockaby Venus by Velasquez. She seemed to contemplate the image for a while. In the room there were two attendant policemen. The woman looked at the painting and went into another room. She later came back. At lunchtime, one of the policemen went off for his lunch. The other opened his newspaper. He then heard the smashing of glass. Assuming it was the skylight above his head, he looked up but saw nothing. Eventually, he noticed the woman furiously hacking at the painting with a butcher's chopper she had concealed in her clothes. The glass broken had been the protective glass placed over the painting to prevent any damage. The lady was stopped and taken away to London's Holloway Prison. The woman was called Mary Richardson. She was a political activist who had decided to do this act of art vandalism as a way to capture media attention. Her aim was not only to push for women to be given the vote, but also to highlight the inhumane treatment of the imprisoned Mrs Pankhurst, one of the leaders of the suffragette movement. The suffragettes used their bodies as a tool in their political movement. Without the power to vote, they had no other artillery. They chained themselves to prominently situated railings and threw themselves in front of horses. Those that survived these acts were then imprisoned and exercised their human right to refuse to eat. Often barbarically, they were force fed with rubber tubes rammed down their throats. This was what was imposed on Emmeline Pankhurst, the figurehead and for many the heroine of the suffragette movement when Richardson was moved to act. The Rockaby Venus was a painting depicting a beautiful nude woman reclining in front of a mirror, the object of the male artistic gaze. The painting was very valuable and had been brought by the British government for a significant Richardson was enraged at how differently two women could be treated, and that a painting of a woman seemed to have more value assigned to it than a real woman. For Richardson, this clarity of fates was too much to bear. Her act of vandalism certainly caused a stir and was covered in the media, and she was sent to prison. 
She used every opportunity she was granted to make her case and explain her cause. It took another four years for women to get the right to vote in parliamentary elections in the UK. The contemporary artist E.J. Major has been moved to reconstruct and revisit this act and her work shoulder to shoulder. It is through Major's work that we have a pseudo photographic record of this event. Talking about why she was drawn to the subject, the artist states, when, Richards, when Mary, Mary Richardson took an ax to the Rockaby Venus in 1914, it was not just the destruction of property, it was the destruction of a particular kind of property, art. Such an act unnerves me, even in a context in which I believe in the struggle, the suffragette. It raises complicated questions regarding the making of art in relation to values, both economic and moral. It's these contradictory responses that interest me and that inform my work. And that's taken from an interview, 7th of July, 2015. So performing as Richardson, Major explores and reinterprets the events that led to the destruction of a work of art. Being an artist lends another layer of reading and interpretation. Although not mentioned as a reason by Richardson or Major for targeting this particular painting, it is hard to ignore that the subject of the painting was a naked woman's body. We are so familiar with this as a subject of traditional and classical art that it can become invisible. Although much time has elapsed since 1914, it is still more common to see women depicted as nudes in painting than to see women artists work in our major galleries and art institutions. This is a point that has been repeatedly made by the political feminist activists of Guerrilla Girls, an anonymous group of artists and art professionals who wear guerrilla masks and take on the names of great women artists from the past. They have been holding demonstrations outside major galleries in the United States for many years. They produce posters and banners to highlight the lack of equality in the art world. Their aim is to name and shame art institutions to improve the quota of women's art, not only that they collect, but also that they put on display. In 1985, they published a poster about the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which read, do women have to be naked to get into the Met? Less than 5% of the art in the modern section is by women, but 85% of the nudes are female. This is taken from the Gorilla Girls website, access Interestingly, the statistics they have produced over the years suggest very little progress on this front. Still, the representation of women as objects and muses reigns in our visual culture and in our art galleries. However, what has changed dramatically is how the depiction of women in art is interpreted. During the feminist art movement in the 1970s, a new wave of feminist art historians started to question the way in which women's bodies have been predominantly depicted in art. Feminist art historians started to use film theory, which itself relies upon a new analysis of Freud and other psychoanalysts' work, to reveal the inherently male patriarchal notion of the gaze. Professor Griselda Pollock has, been, has spent time explaining the process by which women have been constructed in art and in the media as an object. She states, Woman was central to mid 19th century visual representation in a puzzling new formation. So powerful has the regime been in its various manifestations, latterly in photographic and cinematic forms, that we no longer recognize it as representation at all. The ideological construction of an absolute category of women has been effaced, and this regime of representation has naturalized woman as image, beautiful to look at, defined by her looks. This is best exemplified in those 20th century photographic images manufactured to sell the commodities, cosmetics, by which the supposed nature of our sex can be attained by donning the mask of beauty. That's taken from Vision and Difference, Femininity, Feminism and the Histories of Art, 1998, Griselda Pollock. In this text, Pollock sees this process beginning at around the point that Richardson carried out her attack on the rock of Venus. It would also seem that photography as a medium 
especially due to its use in a commercial context in advertising and in magazines, has in fact done much to assist the subjugation and ob objectification of women's bodies. In part, due to its ubiquitous nature, one could argue photography as a medium has done much more damage to the way women are viewed than painting. Paintings we know are fictions, constructs. The danger is that photography is seen as real, truthful and honest, despite the fact that from the outset it has been manipulated and shaped. We are surrounded by manipulated photographic images, often of very young women's bodies. The feminist art movement needed to prevent this being seen as normal or natural. Pollock calls a, gen a generation to action stating, feminist art history should see itself as part of the political initiative of the women's movement. Feminist art history must engage in the politics of knowledge. And that's from 1988. One way feminist artists were to do this was to reclaim their own bodies in the form of performance art. This time the nude bodies shown were the authors of the work, the women themselves. They were the artists and models simultaneously and as such were shifting the tables of power. When discussing feminist art practice in the 1960s and 1970s onwards, in her work, Looking at Women in Self-Portraiture, Frances Borzello states, a major concern of the period was to reclaim the female body from its imprisonment in art as a beautiful, voiceless object to be judged by male spectators. One strategy was for women artists to use their own bodies in their performance, photo and video works, on the principle that as they were in control, they could direct the viewer's response. And that was from 1998. It is this side of performance art and the use of the self that draws women artists today to this area, informed and influenced by early pioneers of the feminist art movement, Carol Schneeman, Yoko Ono, Adrian Piper, Marina Abramovich, Eleanor Antin and Yayoi Kasama to name but a few. An artist who has over the years made this a subtext to her practice is Trish Morris. In her series Front 2005 to 2007, she takes on the role of a female character on a beach. Approaching groups of families and friends whom she does not know, Morrissey picks a woman in the group to become her son. She asks to borrow an item of clothing and then on the last minute asks that woman to come to take the photograph. She then literally takes her place in the shot and the title of the work is the name of the person she impersonates or stands in for. When brought together as a series, a moment of revelation occurs for the viewer as they see that it is the same person, the artist, who appears in each of these different groups. But it's not always women characters that Morrissey chooses to play. Often there's an element of androgyny in her work takes on male characteristics. She talks about gender slippage or fluidity, stating, Sometimes I swap gender in my work, but I'm not a male impersonator. I try to embody my characters fully, to really feel male. I try not to look like I'm in drag. I try to be naturalistic and not to caricature. I bind my breasts, build out my shoulders with padding and stuff. I try to stay understated. My femininity usually peeks through. I think this is not so much a feminist act as trying to picture gender fluidity. And that was an interview with the artist 24th of June, 2015. Using androgyny as a powerful tool is one explored by a range of artists, including Claude Cahoon. It is a way of questioning our assumptions of the rigid roles women and men play in society. It has also been used to express transgendered and homosexual. It essentially undermines the patriarchal male desired gaze, which requires a passive female. Androgyny has powerful political potential for women, not just to pretend to be men, but to do so in a way where the boundaries between male and female qualities are broken down. Gender in some ways becomes irrelevant. 
but it leaves the viewer in an uncomfortable place where they are not able to label or identify. Certainly this ambiguity in part undermines our romantic belief in the veracity of the photographic portrait. From its origins we've been told the camera never lies and that this scientific apparatus can capture a true and real image of the person depicted. This is not the tainted hand of the artist's impression prone to exaggeration and muddied by interpretation. We may believe that somehow a photograph can reveal something to us we would not otherwise see or know about a subject, a myth often propagated by photographers keen to suggest their momentary yet meaningful connection to their celebrity client. So even when the subject depicted as the artists themselves, we do not get access to their inner self. It is a mediated or performed self that we see. None of the artists mentioned here see their work as self-portraits. Sean Bunnell states, I see them more as self-images or self-stagings. They're not portraits because they're not about me. They were never about me. They're about every woman. When I see these pictures, I don't recognise myself at all. And that's from the 1st of July 2015. Yet for some, through the act of performing, like a method actor playing a role, the artist can tap into an element or side of their personality in the performance. As Trish Morrissey states, while there are sometimes part of myself in there, I always feel I'm playing a character, a role as an actor. Though, as any actor would feel, there are elements of me in all the characters I am. I think even when I feel there is nothing of myself in the character, there are some whispers or fragments. 24th of June, 2015. This suggests that the self is a slippery concept, that there is no singular self. Each of us are many different people at different times. There is no one core self to be depicted. Equally, a depiction, whether a film, photograph, painting or sculpture, is just that, a representation. It is a form of fiction, open to interpretation and manipulation, authored by an artist. In 2011, the artist Sean Bunnell was appointed the Photoworks Senior Research Fellowship at the British School of Rome. Spending time looking at the Renaissance paintings and also moving around the streets and markets of Rome, she wondered how she could relate to the depictions of women that surrounded her. Particularly, she wanted to know where the more mature women were. Her series of perform works titled How to Be Holy 2011 was her response to this making a halo out of a gold paper plate and wearing the ubiquitous house coat mature women wore in their daily lives. She started to use the studio space to enact poses she had seen in religious paintings around her. Her movements mimic religious genuflection to almost balletic effect. They employ humour in an effective way. The sublime almost becomes ridiculous as she attempts to express piety and yet equally reveals how unrealistic such images of women are. Highly managed and contrived, the language of Renaissance painting places older women in a symbolic and restricted role of mother, carer, supplicant. The work seems a far cry from the Rockaby Venus and the more usual depiction of women as nudes and sexualized objects of the male. In part, the work grows from the experience of aging as a woman and seeming in so many ways to disappear. In photographs and films, women beyond a certain age seem to become marginalised to the point of apparent obsolescence. Yet in some ways, these works by Bernal seem to be a suitable summary of how a contemporary woman artist approaches this subject. Having gained confidence in her artistic voice, Bernal uses everyday objects to create a new and contemporary visual language. Being both a subject and author of the work, she has found a way to represent herself and women like her in the world. Unable to find herself represented in art displayed on gallery and church walls, her response has been to place herself in the frame. In this work, there's a rally cry, the call to political action. If the image of self is not in the art or in the images in the world around you, create it yourself and use yourself as its subject. 
Bunnell's series can be seen as an inspiration to us all and embodies a spirit of how the personal can be political in contemporary photography. Bunnell's associated series of work, Camera 4 Manners, has, been, has made it into the museum and in 2015, when this paper was given, it was on display as part of the Victorian Albert Museum's photography collection. It was included in their display, a history of photography, series and sequences, and shown from February to November 2015. Mary Richardson would be amazed.